1941, madness seizes the Japanese. Striking at Pearl Harbor, they hope to force America to their... Now China has a mighty ally. America soon be theirs. In Chinese soldiers. Feeding an elephant with an eyedropper, an American veteran calls it. Discouraged Chinese leaders say, our arsenals make only 15 million bullets a month, just four per soldier. How can we fight? Americans discover there are other reasons for poor Chinese morale. Graft in their armies, generals corrupt, incompetent. The soldiers, ill-shod, underfed, and sick. Major General Frank Dorn recalls his training mission at the time. A visiting American general from Washington asked me if he could see some Chinese troops marching on the road. So we drove out. And the first thing we saw, of course, was that the majority, big majority of the troop men had dogs of one kind or description, size, anything that they could have stolen along the way, on ropes, on leashes, on anything. And he smiled and said, here they are, the GIs the world over. They all love dogs. And I said, yes, they certainly love these. And he wanted to know what I meant by that. And I said, well, this is their rations. When they run out of rice and other food, the dogs go into the cook pots. Commanding general for America is Joseph Stilwell. A soldier's soldier, his mission is to train a Chinese army to strike back. In India, training thousands of Chinese flown back across the hump, Stilwell learns to know their true ability but he grows bitter at their government, which cannot nourish them. He feels they can attack and win if led by honest officers, insists that Zhang reorganize his army to throw incompetence out. In Chongqing, this pressure irritates the Generalissimo. He knows that victory is guaranteed by efforts of his allies. His thoughts are on the aftermath of victory, the final struggle for power yet to come. A weariness of spirit seeps through his government. Something fades. They wander alien through this anachronistic city. The fronts are far away. America's flying tigers guard the skies. Their background of big city life cuts them from direct involvement with these peasant people. Little luxuries, little pleasures occupy too many minds, too long exhausted by the years of sacrifice. Yet nonetheless, the prestige of Jiang's government grows. Foreign diplomats court his favor, do him honor. In 1943, at Cairo's wartime summit conference, he sits with Roosevelt and Churchill, accepted now as equal of the great, consulted on the strategy of global war, assured of China's freedom, China's greatness in the post-war world. From Yenan's tawny hills, the communists watch all this and brood. Unrecognized by foreign powers, they know their strength is growing. Not foreign aid, but peasant emotions give power. And Mao too is hardening. Like Zhang, he thinks beyond the war to what must follow. Twenty years of flight and fighting have toughened him to hardship. But his memory too is scarred. By Zhang, by white men, Russians and Americans alike. His troops swell daily behind enemy lines. His self-assuredness freezes to dogma. He has been right so often when others made mistakes, his truths become, for communists, a holy script. Colonel David Barrett, chief of the American military liaison team in Yenan, watched all this and recalls, They uh, emphasized that they had to give the troops political training because the political consciousness of the peasants who made up the Chinese communist armies were very low. So therefore, they said, we have to give them political training. I told them, I said, in the United States Army, we look with this disfavor on giving political training. We think we should devote our whole time to military training. Well, they said, that is not the case in our army because we consider military training and political training as equally important and one cannot be neglected uh, for the other. Zhu De agrees with Mao. Power is what comes out of a muzzle of a gun. But ideas, politics, must motivate the man behind the gun, a concept the nationalists only dimly grasp. Theodore White recalls how powerful communist motivation could be. I went with a group of Chinese nationalist guerrillas who were organizing resistance 
behind the Japanese lines. And uh, there was a young nationalist lieutenant and two horsemen and myself. We traveled behind the Japanese lines for, oh, I'd say two or three days. And then the Japanese flushed us. And we ran like mad. And they chased us all day. And by the time we arrived in a mountain village at night, the horses were completely worn out, saddle galled and their flanks heaving. And we were as tired and just as scared. And we asked the villagers to give us water and fodder for our horses. And I heard the young Chinese officer say, Woman Shibalu Jun, we are of the Eighth Root Army. And I said to him, look, we're nationalists not Eighth Root Army guerrillas. And he said, shut up. If we tell them we're nationalists, they won't feed our horses or water them. It was the first sense I'd ever had of the political grip the communists had acquired on the minds and the hearts of the people in the occupied areas. As war wears on, American aid increases, and Jiang is pleased. Reviewing the new divisions Stilwell has trained and equipped, Jiang hoards these splendid forces. They will be useful later. Stilwell violently objects. He wants to use them now against Japan. He has no interest in future civil war. Stilwell feels unless Jiang purifies his government, not only is he no help in this war, but once the war is over, surely the communists will win. Their quarrel grows. From Washington flies a mission to heal the nasty breach under Major General Patrick Hurley, an Oklahoma politician. Jiang sees this as more white man's arrogance, a meddling in the politics of China. No compromise is possible, and Stilwell is relieved of command in 1944. Certain American involvement in Asia will be long and tragic. The world rejoices as in 1945, the Japanese surrender, the guns they hope forever stilled. To sign the document of surrender aboard the Missouri, the Allies, America, England, Russia, invite Japan's first victim, China. In their eyes, China's only spokesman is Chiang Kai-shek, who sends nationalist generals to represent his people. The communists are absent. For Chinese, this is but the curtain to an act, the climax yet to come in clash with communists. To stop this dreadful prospect, General Patrick Hurley, now named ambassador, flies off to Yenan. He urges Mao, the war is over, let there be peace. Let Mao and Zhang divide the country politically, but unify both rival armies under a central government. America will underwrite the deal. Hurley puts a plane at Mao's disposal to explore the proposition in Chongqing. Thus, Mao arrives on the first plane flight he has ever taken. His safety guaranteed by Americans, this is his first face-to-face -face contact with the Kuomintang since the killings and uprisings of 1927. Six weeks of negotiation will produce apparent agreement as Zhang plays host to Mao before departure. The plans that lurk behind their smiles, however, deceive all Western eyes. For in the field, a race is on. Across the land, the broken Japanese must sign defeat, yield cities, garrisons, and guns. But which Chinese will take the guns and occupy the cities, communist or nationalist? The nationalists, with all the transport of America at their disposal, emplane their troops to seize the cities of the Yangtze Valley. This ease of movement will lead them on to larger appetite. Dispersion of their forces up from the Yangtze to seize the cities not only of North China, but beyond. Manchuria with its vital industry and rails. Nor will the communists sit still. Together, Mao and Zhu, like Jiang, decide the key lies in Manchuria. They choose Lin Biao as field commander to make the dash. From Yan'an and North China, they will strike east and north while Zhang is readying troops to move from Yangtze ports and airfields. By foot and pack train, Lin Biao sets out. The Russians have temporarily occupied Manchuria by the surrender terms with Japan. Communists expect to get from Russians surrendered Japanese equipment and guns and hold the countryside before Zhang arrives. 
The rumble of inevitable clash causes America to replace Hurley with General George Marshall. This architect of global victory is sent to save the peace for which so brilliantly he labored. Received by John Kaishek, Marshall gropes for American solution to the bitter revolutionary surges of a strange Asian nation torn by barbarisms a generation old. To his Chongqing headquarters, he invites a communist delegation led by Zhou Enlai, chief communist negotiator, to meet with Chiang Kai-shek's spokesman. Marshall suggests, and they agree to, an American answer for China's groping search for order. A federal government peacefully permitting the two parties to govern provinces they now hold politically. Freedom of speech permitted everywhere, and disputes resolved by talk, not guns. In January 1946, both parties celebrate a truce with a handshake. No paper truce, however, can mend a nation ripped apart by 50 years of killing. Within two months, troops are on the move again. Each side blames the other, but a hundred savage skirmishes now flare to full-scale war. Manchuria is the cockpit of the struggle. The industry Japan has built and left is the greatest prize in China. Zhang's American-equipped troops seize all major cities to find a hollow triumph. The Russian occupiers have looted every factory before withdrawal. Ripped-out sockets show where great machines once stood. For Mao, the fighting in Manchuria is prelude to the climax of his theories. The day when guerrilla bands group into formal armies and shove frontal combat at a weary enemy. He fights for more than safety now. His ambition seeks to mold all China to his theories. I asked Mao Zedong what their policy was with regard to freedom of the press, and he said they believed in absolute freedom of press and absolute freedom of speech, and it wasn't going to be like Chongqing when they won. Everybody would have the right to say whatever he felt. It wouldn't be censorship the way Chiang Kai-shek had in Chongqing. So uh, I said, you, you really mean that? And he said, of course we mean it. And I said, do you mean that if you come to power, anybody will be able to print anything he wants in a newspaper or publish any newspaper he wants? And Mao Zedong said, of course, he said, except for enemies of the people. Nor did he ever define, and I was too young to ask him to define what he meant by enemies of the people. Obviously, now it means anybody who disagrees with him. In summer 46, Zhang returns his government to Nanking and once again, as 17 years before, reports the victory of his cause at Sun Yat-sen's mausoleum. The fighting in the north is only distant thunder in the Yangtze Valley. American advisors urge he seize this moment to win the hearts and firm the loyalties of his people by new reforms. Thus, in Nanking, Zhang convenes a Congress to write a modern constitution in one last try to govern China by the order Sun Yat-sen has preached. But the thrust of all his background is still military. His troops must win by force of arms. With American arms, he feels the communists can be crushed, but his troops dig in to garrison rail junctions, cities they have occupied. American advisors insist such static defense is major error. They say he pins down his best divisions where communist guerrillas will isolate them. The queen city of Zhang's victorious China is Shanghai, restored at last to Chinese rule, all foreigners' concessions wiped out. While battle flares in the northern provinces, Shanghai seems to thrive. The long war's dislocation has filled the streets with hungry refugees and homeless laborers, who offer muscle energy for little more than rice to feed them. But after 50 years of suffering, such sights are almost normal. What worries Shanghailanders most is this, their money. For slowly, then more swiftly, through 46 and 47, the cost of distant civil war destroys the value and the meaning of these bundled paper dollars. Inflation ruins the vital middle class of all the cities, the one great source of Jiang's political support. Novelist Stephen Becker remembers the panic years. The inflation was heartbreaking. 
When I got there in August of 1947, the exchange rate was 60,000 yuan to one American dollar. And when I left in September of 1948, it was 20 million yuan to one. But people on relatively fixed incomes were just ruined. In the summer of 1948, my wife and I had a continental dinner at one of Shanghai's best hotels. And the check came to 250 million yuan. Who lost China to the Reds, ignorant men will someday ask. But now in 1948, sorrow scrawls its signature clear. Too many years of death and flight, too many dreams betrayed. In 50 years of barbarism, a gangrene of the spirit has set in, erasing pride and will and hope. Peace, whisper the communists to weary minds. Peace, an end to roaming. Now submit. Peace, they say, accept our mastery. And peace. Land, they say, to landless peasants, refugees. Join us, they promise, and the land will be divided. All through North China slip their cadres, calling meetings to share out the landlord's fields, which soon they plan to snatch away again. In summer 1948, Mao makes his master move. Assault by frontal armies in Manchuria. Guerrilla bands emerge from hiding, form up in full divisions, equipped with captured tanks, artillery, and guns. Zhang's garrisons are isolated by ruptured railways, hostile peasants. November 1948, Manchuria falls. Panic begins among the cut-off nationalist garrisons in North China. Surrendering by scores, then thousands, then full divisions, the equipment America has given them falls to the Reds. To America, her second homeland, flies Madame Zhang Kai-shek in November 48 to make a last appeal for further help. But Harry Truman has had enough. Reluctantly, he tells her, American involvement must end. And now the nationalists, pursued by wrath, as they in years gone by did once pursue the communists, gather at Suzhou, last bastion guarding access to the mighty Yangtze's Valley. For two full months, Zhang's troops fight on. In January, cut off, they must surrender. Half a million soldiers lost. The communists pour south. His spirit heavy burdened, Zhang resigns his leadership, hoping other men may court the communists for better terms. On April 1st, the Nationalists send emissaries to Peking to plead with Mao Zedong. But they have passed the point of no return. No mercy, say the Communists. The new mandate of heaven requires all Nationalists to lay down arms within three weeks. Three weeks later to the day, the Communists uncoil to cross the Yangtze. First target is Nanking, the hallowed capital of the Guomindang. But in that capital, the will to fight has turned to dust. No man will stand the ramparts. Abandoning positions, troops trudge away as silent people stand and watch. Too many warring armies have passed this desolate way to make them want to fight for any faith or any politics. No mainland refuge now remains, and fleeing nationalists embark what troops they can to cross the ocean for the island of Formosa. Shanghai hears the message clearly as foreign businessmen board up their shops. Go now, go quickly, for communism marches. Take what you can, but flee. In pell-mell haste, the Western powers evacuate the city they have built, for good and bad alike must leave. The businessmen come for profit, as well as missionaries come to heal, must say goodbye as out the Yangtze steams the last of Western influence and farewell to a century. May 27, 1949. Down Shanghai's princely avenues, the pleasure boulevards of yesteryear, rolls the victorious red tide. In six more months, all China will submit. Red Star triumphant, hoisted over the world's most ancient nation. Silently, the crowds observe their newest conquerors.
Today, in 1967, the marble altars of Peking still beseech the will of heaven as always. Chinese still gather here to listen to the voices that interpret heaven's will. <laughs> For 18 years, this man alone has tried to shape their thinking, has offered them his universal truths, a dogma changeless as Confucius, to freeze their muffled discontent and end their quenchless modern turbulence. The image shown his people has been a teacher, grandfather benign, yet all have learned that those who cannot read his lessons will be crushed. His aging mind still lusts for permanent strife. The theme he preaches to old and young alike is hate. We are small militia men fighting U.S. imperialism. Uncle, we must grow up quick and go to liberate Taiwan. Taiwan, the object of their hate, we call Formosa. This rocky island, 90 miles off the mainland, has many meanings. To statesmen, it is the last remaining redoubt of the Guomindang, where Chiang Kai-shek with American arms has re-equipped an army 600,000 strong and dreams reconquest. But Chiang is pawned to American policy. He cannot move these troops or fuel them unless America lets him do so. Now 80, Chiang Kai-shek bespeaks for mainland China another threat. To Formosa in his flight, Zhang has carried the ancient Imperial Museum of Peking, the treasures of 800 years of Chinese art, symbol of another China, beauty past. It is this echo of the past that has bedeviled Mao, who seeks erasure of all past. Yet how Mao's struggle goes, we cannot tell. At the American consulate in Hong Kong, there are cascades, mountains, piles of translations that come in from the Chinese. And these are sandy, gritty, gravelly little bits of information that are meaningless because we don't know who does what to who in Peking. We don't know how they think or how they make up their mind because no matter how hard we study China, we cannot predict such a thing as the Great Leap Forward in 1958. We can't predict such a thing as the Red God Purge of 1966. It's as if there were a struggle of sea monsters going on, deep, deep beneath the surface of our vision. And only these bubbles come to the surface to tell us that these are terrible struggles, but we don't know what they're struggling about. Today, in total ignorance, we strain to know of China, as once our ancestors strained to peer across the mysterious wall, not knowing myth from fact. We know industry grows. Steel production swollen 10 times to 12 million tons a year. Light industry soaring. But what comfort it gives the people, we cannot judge. We know beyond this wall live people of dazzling historical ability. The forefathers of these students first invented paper, printing, books, gunpowder, the clock, the compass. In 1967, they loft rockets. In 65, they synthesized insulin. In 64, they unlocked the atom secrets. From behind the wall rise boastful statistics. But we know that China's people hunger have barely survived one of the worst famines in all history. That driven by communist cadres, Peasants work in communes, today still beasts of labor as their fathers were. Within these walls, tyranny has tried to reach beyond the body to the inner recesses of the soul. I woke at midnight and saw my little brother smiling. I asked him why he smiled and he said, I dreamed of Chairman Mao.
The purpose of all learning is to fathom what goes on in Chairman Mao's mind. This mind holds all the truths that ever were or will be. Neither age, nor place, nor class has allowed escape from pounding, the chanting of Mao's litany in railroad stations, in stores, at work. Even those who built the wall so long ago must be forgotten, they have been told. No history but Mao's. The aging leaders who shared the hills of hiding 40 years ago, trekked the long march, withstood Japan, America, the Guomindang, must now again pass judgment on their revolution. They writhe and split. Within these walls, they clash. They seek replacement for a chief whose triumphs make him think himself the voice of heaven, the universal sage. This is their bomb. In 10 years time, there will be more. The nightmare problem of our time shapes clear. To reach the minds of Mao's successors with reason, before unreasoning bombs take up the dialogue. It does no good to mourn the past. We pass along a road of time which, always turning, never brings us back to the crossroads marked again. Perhaps we should never have disturbed the slumbering civilization of China, or else let it wake of itself and reach for us. Perhaps China is too vast to be governed by mercy. Yet if the Chinese mind craves order, they must be brought to recognize they are the biggest factor in the world's disorder. And we must untangle the madness of their mind. The most difficult task in the world is to reach the minds of men who hate you. We do not flinch from the immediate tasks to guard our skies, defend our friends. We cannot flinch from tomorrow's task to reach the mind. We race today to reach the moon. To reach that mind is a task of equal difficulty and far greater urgency.